language, English. Kingston is chosen as the capital. The Reform Alliance undergoes a baptism of fire in the first election since the defeat of the rebellions. Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine is running for election in Terrebonne, a county he represented before the rebellions. But the only polling office has been placed at the entrance of a village that is mostly English. When Lafontaine and his supporters show up to vote, a mob is waiting. And so, I inform the returning officer that, in order to avoid bloodshed and the massacre of great numbers, I was withdrawing from the contest. Without La Fontaine in the House of Assembly, the Reform Alliance is in danger. Robert Baldwin turns to his father, who is running for office in a Toronto riding. I think it would be very desirable that you should, though you may have already accepted the nomination for North York, suggest to them the expediency of accepting your retirement and of returning Mr. Lafontaine, if he will accept the nomination instead of you. I am satisfied that nothing that could be done at this conjuncture would have a better effect upon the state of parties in the House than his return just now for North York. La Fontaine accepts the offer and wins the election. A French-Canadian patriot elected in an English riding. A year later, they win another victory when Baldwin is elected in Rimouski in the Lower St. Lawrence. These gestures of goodwill strengthen the alliance between reformers from both Canadas and the personal friendship of both men. Together, Baldwin and La Fontaine lead the battle for a government run by the people's elected representatives. And in the years to come, La Fontaine can rely on Baldwin's support to restore the French language in Parliament. In the mid-19th century, Britain is rewriting the rules of empire. Her leaders decide to scrap the system that until now has favored products from British colonies. Manufacturers can now buy raw materials wherever they are cheapest. It's a change that hits the colonies hard. But with looser economic ties, the empire can also relax its political control. At last, the reformers of British North America are granted what they have been demanding for decades, the power of self-government. The moment Joseph Howe has been awaiting for so long has finally arrived. In 1847, his party wins the Nova Scotia election and a few months later takes power the first responsible government in the colonies of the British Empire. It will be our pride to make Nova Scotia a normal school for the rest of the colonies, showing them how representative institutions may be worked to ensure internal tranquility and advancement in subordination to the paramount interest and authority 
of the Empire. At the same time, the province of Canada is in the midst of an election. The reformers, led by Baldwin and Lafontaine, are victorious here as well. The goal of the union of the two provinces was the destruction of the French Canadians. Since then, things have changed. The author of this measure was mistaken. He wanted to lay low a whole category of citizens. But today, the facts show that everyone is on equal footing. The province has passed through a long and arduous struggle for the establishment of a system of government founded on the broad basis of British constitutional principles. Your favor and the confidence of a large portion of the people of my country placed me in a position in which I was called upon to perform no unimportant part in the great battle of the Constitution. The battle has been fought. The victory has been achieved. But the rejoicing is short-lived. In Parliament, now located in Montreal, the Baldwin-Lafontaine government introduces a controversial bill. Lafontaine proposes compensation for Lower Canadians, whose property was destroyed during the rebellions and in the reprisals that followed. All those who can prove their losses and have not been convicted of sedition will be compensated. It will put self-government to its first crucial test. The Rebellion Losses Bill puts the new Governor-General, Lord Elgin, in a difficult position. If he rejects the bill, he will undermine the very foundation of responsible government. If he approves it, he will incur the wrath of many English citizens of Lower Canada who see the bill as a measure to reward traitors. A good deal of excitement and bad feeling has been stirred. The opposition leaders, who are very low in the world at the moment, have taken advantage of the circumstance to work upon the feelings of the old loyalists as opposed to rebels, of British as opposed to French, and of Upper Canada as opposed to Lower. And thus, to provoke from various parts of the province the expression of not very temperate or measured discontent. Lord Elgin finally decides to accept the bill. As he leaves Parliament, an angry mob awaits him. Many of the English in Montreal feel betrayed by the governor and by England. The disgrace of Great Britain accomplished. Canada sold and given away. The end has begun. Anglo-Saxons, you must live for the future. Your blood and your race will now be supreme. A mass meeting will be held on the Place d'Arme this evening at 8 o'clock. To the struggle. Now is your time. crowd marches in fury on Parliament. The rioters break down the doors and set fire to the building, which rapidly succumbs to the flames. The 
eruption of rage in Montreal distresses Joseph Howe. We hear a great deal about anglifying the French Canadians. And a union of the provinces is sometimes advocated with a view to swamping and controlling that portion of the population, which being of French origin still preserve their ancient religion, manners and language. But if the process of anglifying is to include any species of injustice to that large body of British subjects, who already form at least one half of the population of United Canada, to such a design, no matter in what form pressed or by whom entertained, we will be no parties. The burning of Parliament is a last desperate act by the opponents of reform. These men, with their privileged connections to England, are now terribly weakened. By signing the Rebellion Losses Bill, Lord Elgin has confirmed that the colonists can make their own decisions from now on. And by bridging the divide between English and French, Baldwin and La Fontaine have ushered in an era of democratic reform. A decade after the burning of Parliament, peace and prosperity have returned to Canada. The beginning of this new age is witnessed by a new eye, that of the photographer. Two and a half million people now live in the colonies of British North America. Harvests are good. Sawmills are selling their wood to the United States. The bustling colonial ports send their ships around the world. New canals link the St. Lawrence to the Great Lakes. In 1851, Robert Baldwin retires from public life. He is only 47 years old but the parliamentary battles he has led for a decade have exhausted him. He dies eight years later. Louis-Paulette Lafontaine leaves politics only a few months after his friend Baldwin. He is also tired and ill. He dies at the age of 56. After his return from exile, William Lyon Mackenzie is elected to the Parliament of the Province of Canada, but he is largely ignored. A bitter man, Mackenzie retires from politics in 1859 and dies two years later at 66. Now back in Canada, Louis-Joseph Papineau also makes a brief return to politics, but like Mackenzie, he has lost his audience. He retires with his wife, Julie, to his estate. Papineau dies in 1871, a few days before his 85th birthday. Joseph Howe is the only one of these leaders to carry on with his political career. He becomes the champion of the railway, symbol of the Industrial Revolution, and the building of a new nation. A country that will soon expand far westward. Across the prairies and over the Rockies to the shores of the Pacific, Canada. Canadian, here on.